Hello, so today's episode is a little bit of a hodgepodge. I have four things I want to talk about. Uh, one is um, a response to last week's episode, one is a bit of advice, and then I have uh, two, uh, I guess, stories to tell. Um, one about operant conditioning. Uh, and my daughter, and the other uh, about some dog training success I've had with my own dog, uh, a sort of clever solution to a problem I was having that um, I'd like to uh, tell you all about, because uh, maybe this, um, <laughs> this uh, what would you call it, scheme that I've come up with um, could work for you too. Okay. First thing I want to address is that uh, we're about a week away from Halloween and I've had a couple people say to me, you really need to do some kind of episode about Halloween, although um, every year uh, when people start suggesting this, it's already October and I think to myself, um, I should have done an episode about this six months ago. Um, because if you are going to dress up your dog for Halloween, you should start acclimating them to that costume well in advance, ideally. Um, but uh, the other reason um, around this time of year I, I always hesitate to talk about Halloween, although I guess I have in the past, is that my advice about dogs and costumes and Halloween at this point is so um, simple that I feel like I can't fill up a whole episode talking about it. My advice is don't do it. <laughs> don't dress up your dog for Halloween. Um, now, uh, sure, there are some people who really are going to put in the work to acclimate a dog to be, uh, uh, to be comfortable in um, some kind of get-up uh, months in advance. Other people have um, real, really bomb-proof dogs. It doesn't matter if you um, if you strap a cardboard piano to your dog. I always, you know, there's this in New York City where I am. There's this um, Tompkins Square Halloween parade for dogs every year. That I mean, yes, I know it's fun to do things with your dogs, but um, but the costumes some people come up with. I mean, sometimes they're really clever and funny. Um, but sometimes they're just like, I, the one I always think of is this guy glued a piano, like a card piano he made out of cardboard to his dog somehow. I guess he didn't glue it exactly to his dog, but you know what I mean. It was basically like a cardboard piano atop a dog. And I thought, this isn't a dog dressed up as a piano. This is a cardboard piano balanced on top of a dog, which is, it's strange. And when you think about it from a dog's point of view, um, going to a parade like this dressed up uh, balancing this weird object on your back, probably for the first time, uh, maybe uncomfortable, certainly unsure about what's going on, and then you're in a sea of other dogs who are also balancing uh, weird cardboard human creations on on themselves. It's if if you try and picture what it might be like for a dog, the whole thing is is pretty weird. Um, so uh, again, if you have a dog that you can do anything to and your dog is fine, then then go f for it. You know, let your let your dog um, dress up as Princess Leia. But um, for everyone else, um, keep an eye out for your dog's body language. Make sure your dog really is as comfortable as you would like your dog to be. Uh, there are too many photos on Facebook, on Instagram at this time of year of dogs who you think look cute, um, but they are feeling pretty stressed out. And as a dog trainer, um, I'm not into it. So, um, uh, I love when people come up with really chill costumes for dogs, costumes, um, that, uh, are that don't involve um, uh, cardboard, huge cardboard pianos on tiny chihuahuas. Um, one really simple costume that I've seen people uh, put together is a tie tag, tie like T-Y, um, like those uh, gunned animals, stuffed animals 
that that uh, I know I had as a kid, or Beanie Babies too, um, would come with this tag that's like the shape of a heart. It says T-Y on it in lowercase, and um, I think that's a really cute, really easy costume. Just make a big tag out of cardboard, or you can even buy these as uh, dog costumes and put it around your dog's neck on their collar. Um, done and simple and sweet, and uh, hey, your dog is dressed up like a doggy beanie baby. Especially works well on um, dogs that are, you know, doodles, sort of teddy teddy bear-like dogs. Uh, I've also seen people make a Scooby-Doo tag. If you have, you know, a nice big brown dog, uh, American brown dog, as my friend Kiki Yablon calls uh, <laughs> calls uh, brown mutts. Um, or a bloodhound type dog, whatever. Uh, make a Scooby Doo, t- Scooby Doo tag, um, turquoise diamond shape that says S and D on it. Another alternative is chalk, like hair chalk. If you have a dog who's a lighter color, you can use hair chalk. Uh, and uh, I don't know, give your dog um, some hair color. I actually did this with my dog uh, Amos once. He was all black. I said light color dogs, but it can work on dark color dogs too with um, white hair chalk. I gave him one time uh, for Halloween stripes. <laughs> so he looked like a like he was wearing prisoner garb. Uh, and another time I put white all the way down his back to make him look like a skunk. There's also a company called Pet Paint that makes dog hairsprays, colored hairsprays, and they even sell stencils. So you can um, stencil your dog with spray paint like a cheetah, or you can stencil spiders or hearts. Um, really, really kind of interesting, interesting company, petpaint.com. Um, only problem is when I've experimented with pet paint is um, some dogs are really scared by the sound of a spray can essentially um but you know the company also makes um dog hair extensions and dog diamonds uh which can be glued onto a dog's fur with um pet safe glue so those are sort of some other alternatives things that you can do that don't involve um putting your dogs in crazy outfits one other thing we did at school for the dogs a few years ago uh, was we made costumes out of cones, um, the, you know, like e-collars that dogs have to wear uh, when they're recovering from surgery or whatever. Um, and uh, I think we tried to do it like a month early and we decorated them like we, we put sort of olives, big olives on one made out of styrofoam balls um, so that it looked like a martini glass. Uh, another one we glued cardboard petals to it so it looked like a flower but it was about you know how can we teach the dogs to wear these collars that are going to be um, something they might actually have to wear at some point anyway so how can we acclimate them to wearing collars but also sort of at the same time turn it into a costume make it fun da 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 Um, but if you're jonesing to make some sort of elaborate dog costume that might make your dog feel uncomfortable um take that energy and find someone who has a kid and (laughs) make the costume costume for them or make it for yourself that's my not very fun advice on that second thing i wanted to talk about uh was last week's episode which was an interview with the lawyer who is putting together a case that uh, might end up going to trial against caesar milan representing this um young woman who was uh, quite brutally attacked by uh, Caesar Milan's late dog, Junior. Uh, I got some response to this episode that, um, not quite critical, I guess I would just say response uh, from, mostly from professional dog trainers who seemed disappointed that, um, Brian Adisman, uh, the lawyer, uh, did not seem more informed about how poor or um, out of date Caesar Milan's techniques are. And I have to say, uh, it was a little bit tricky interviewing him as someone who is so passionate about this stuff 
because I called up him to find out more about this case. I didn't really feel like I was in the position of schooling him about, um, you know, what good dog training really looks like in my opinion. And this is something I've run into a, a few times before, you know, I was I've spent about half of my adult life now as a dog trainer, and, and the the um, half of my adult life before that I spent as a, a journalist, and while I see myself as attempting to uh, meld those two things, um, I mean, in talking about dogs, writing about dogs, et cetera, et cetera, it's hard for me to do it in the way that I would have imagined doing it. I mean, before I became a dog trainer really working with people, I thought, well, I'll, I'll write about dogs and I'm going to use what I've, what I've learned about dog training to be a full-time, I don't know, like pet-related journalist. And I've talked uh, in the episode I did with Kiki Yablon a few weeks ago, I talked a little bit about why that was problematic. But uh, one reason I don't think I talked about in that episode that it's been problematic not totally undoable, but just um, difficult, is that I really can't approach this stuff at this point without very strong opinions. So I feel like I'm I'm more of an, uh, an op-ed uh, dog um, journalist at this point, if I, if I am that at all. And um, so it, it, it just put me in a, in a funny place as I was interviewing him because... Um, yeah, I too felt that he was not super informed about dog training and the kind of uh, divide uh, in the world of dog training between um, people who uh, strongly believe in using the least invasive uh, techniques possible, positive reinforcement uh, as much as possible, etc., and the so-called balanced trainers of the world who um, talk about the importance of the four quadrants, or or people like Caesar Milan, who I don't even think it talks in terms of stuff like quadrants and is more um, into the pseudoscience of uh, energy, uh, blah blah blah. The those who believe in dominance. Dominance-based training paired with um, this kind of uh, science denial, superstitious approach. Don't walk through the door before your dog. Blah, 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 blah. So I don't think Brian Adisman is particularly well-informed about um, science-based, reward-based dog training, uh, nor do I think he is really thinking about this case in terms of dog training techniques and how poor dog training resulted not only in this attack, but um, surely in many more attacks by dogs who have been trained, if you want to call it that, by people using Caesar Milan's methods uh, who have gone on to hurt people um, cases that have not entered uh, the courts or um, the media. I don't think he's uh, very informed about dog training, but but most people aren't. If this case goes to court, uh, I hope that he will become more informed, and uh, I will certainly... Uh, offer him resources. Uh, Maybe I will send him this episode as a starting point. It could really change things for a lot of people and a lot of dogs out there if some of his spurious techniques were um, laid out in a public manner in front of a judge. Uh, A couple people told me they feared that the case would go more in the direction of encouraging people to fear pit bulls um, and to be about breed legislation, which I am definitely against. Uh, And I also fear things could go in that direction. So Brian, if you're listening, uh, I don't think this is a case about how pit bulls are bad, more dangerous than any specific breed of dog is this uh, still widespread notion 
that dogs need to be trained with fear and intimidation and energy and uh, I don't know what else to call it, woo. And that um, not only was it dangerous for uh, this person who many people would think is um, the most expert dog training trainer in the world to have a uh, dog roaming around his office who um, could bite someone, um, but it's uh, dangerous to have such a person uh, who is not certified not using modern approaches, not using the science to uh, give people advice on dog training, period. Also, someone pointed out to me that he said uh, that dog training is an inherently dangerous profession or something like that, which I, I don't even remember hearing him say. Uh, I wish I had interjected when he did say that, but I, I must have been thinking about what my next question was going to be or something. Um, because, yeah, it should not be an inherently dangerous position. I can definitely see why uh, someone who knows nothing about dog training might say that or think that. But in my experience, good dog trainers do not get bit. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it really shouldn't happen. And... That's not only because of precautions that we put in place. It's also because we're using methods that are setting up our dogs to succeed. If you ever have watched any of Cesar Milan's shows, you'll know that he goes in and says, show me the problem. And then he sees a dog do all the things that the people don't want the dogs to do. Bite, jump, pull, react in... Uh, not good ways and um i don't know any dog trainer who is any good who would ever do that we don't want to see the behaviors that we are trying to get rid of because in those cases the dog is just practicing those behaviors we're trying to set the dog up for success there was a comment on my instagram um i thought this person bursama dogs said it really well they said defining dog training as an inherently dangerous profession could potentially hinder efforts towards science-based lima methods lima standing for least invasive minimally aversive um, i don't consider this a risk-free profession but i certainly would consider myself poorly skilled if i'm often provoking dogs to attack me the third thing i wanted to talk about is buy nothing so Buy Nothing is a Facebook group, or many Facebook groups. They're neighborhood-based, so I'm in a Buy Nothing for uh, my neighborhood in Manhattan. Um, but basically, they're just places where people can post things that they're trying to get rid of or things um, that they are looking for but don't want to buy. Um, and uh, there's also other groups. There's an email list called Trash Nothing, or you could use, um, uh, which is basically the same thing, or on Craigslist, people give things away for free all the time. I've done plenty of that. And, um, but I've been really into it lately uh, because my husband and I, um, now that we have a second kid and live in a New York City apartment, have been trying to get rid of stuff to make as much space as possible and sort of a funny aside um, one of my best friends and I uh, have sort of together um, been using buy nothing a lot in our separate locations she's in Jersey and we like send each other um, the most ridiculous things that we see on buy nothing and she's actually a reporter for the New York Times and she just did um, this really funny column all about buy nothing where she quoted in the column one of the women who has taken lots of things from me in my neighborhood um, because that's sort of part of what's funny about buy nothing is like some people are really vigilant and clearly getting tons of stuff from buy nothing going going around their neighborhoods um, uh, the not not cleaning out their apartments but but taking taking things to fill up their apartments um, Anyway, so I have been giving away things on Buy Nothing, which I love to do because it makes me feel like um, things are going into someone's home, rather into landfill. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit better about our um, c 
consumerist uh, society. But my husband totally does not get it. He's like, you are not going to stop the landfills from uh, piling up by uh, giving away this random Tupperware container rather than putting it in the trash. He's like, let someone else buy their own damn Tupperware container. And he's seen me go through some admittedly crazy lengths. Um, There was one time where I exchanged something like um, 20 messages with this woman in my neighborhood coordinating her picking up a package I had of uh, 10 binder clips, which you could probably buy at Staples for $3. Anyway, his um, lighthearted critique of my obsession with getting rid of things on Buy Nothing uh, just sort of made me reflect on it a little bit more. Why am I doing this? What am I getting out of it besides just getting rid of stuff, which um, is uh, something that does inherently feel good. And I thought, you know, it's how would I look at this <laughs> as in a dog training way? And I thought, you know, I guess this is really about classical conditioning. I am helping people have good associations with with me, really. I'm giving you something that you want. You're coming to my apartment to get the thing. I guess you could say I'm training people to feel good about by nothing as an organization um, and sort of training people to feel good about me as I'm giving them something that they want. But of course, in general, I'm probably never going to see these people again, so I don't really care too much what they think about me. Um, I mean, I guess by nothing as an organization, and Rhonda, my friend, talks about this in the article she just wrote, it's it's supposed to be about, you know, building communities, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe in different times, uh, you know, I would maybe invite someone into my apartment to have a glass of wine before they leave with my old Ikea coffee table. But let's face it, we're not living in a moment where anyone is too thrilled about inviting strangers into their homes to hang out. So then I thought, well, if I was trying to use operant conditioning to train these people to do something more than just come to my apartment and get my old shit, (laughs) what what would I want them to do? I mean, I have a reward that I am offering these people, so one would think maybe there would be some kind of behavior they could engage in to get this reward, and I really couldn't think of anything that would be appropriate. But then I did. It dawned on me what I needed these people to do. So let me back up a second and remind faithful listeners of the episode I did a few weeks ago where I talked about this um, incident where uh, this guy, I think, having a mental episode wandered into our apartment over the summer, and everyone was fine, and we all recovered super quickly from this uh, strange event, except for our dog, Poppy, who was really traumatized by the whole episode and became pretty reactive to anyone entering our apartment, at least anyone that she didn't know. And so I wrote to half a dozen or so friends a week or so after uh, it happened, uh, friends of mine who Poppy has never met, to see if I could get them to come over at some point um, so that I could work with Poppy on this issue but it ended up being really hard to get anyone to come over. Uh, It was just logistically hard for for me and for them to organize, and I kind of gave up on trying to solicit my friends to help me with this dog training task. And you know it can be hard to predict when someone's coming to your apartment, especially, again, in COVID times, not having a whole lot of people over. Uh, Whenever we ordered food, I would try and be very... like thoughtful about it and make sure that I was prepared to work with Poppy when the food delivery person uh, buzzed and came to the door. But then it hit me that with Buy Nothing, I had exactly what I needed. I uh, had a situation where people were willingly coming to my apartment. 
uh, I knew when they were going to show up pretty much and I had a reward for them they were coming literally to get something that they wanted so what more of an incentive could there be anyway once this dawned on me I started getting rid of so <laughs> much stuff like walking around my apartment trying to find things that I can post to buy nothing because it's been possible to get pretty much someone every single day to come by and take something and in the process I can get in like a minute of working with Poppy because you know people are coming by to get something I haven't even told them that uh, I'm working with my dog I've just found that um, people are willing to kind of stand in my doorway for 30 seconds or a minute while I give treats to my dog on her dog bed 12 feet away from the door um, because they're getting something for nothing. So I, I stand uh, by her bed giving her treats and I, I try and talk to the person a little bit, you know, and usually conversation comes up, oh, I have a dog and uh, uh, your dog is cute, whatever. You know, it's actually kind of a nice interaction and it has done wonders. Poppy is doing so much better. Everyone's been commenting on it. She still barks a little bit, but barking's not the end of the world. She does run to her bed now when uh, the doorbell goes off. I also have a treat and train. I keep the button for the treat and train by, the, uh, by my intercom. So I start triggering the treat and train so it dispenses treats near her bed. Um, as soon as someone rings and then I go over to the bed and give her treats at the bed and then I usually if the person's okay with it will let her go say hi to whoever's at the door um, but at that point she has sort of calmed down and she's not you know rushing at the door barking uh, and fearful she is in a much better space um, to make that introduction uh, with the person at the door so it's, it's been a huge game changer. And what's hilarious is I didn't even, I, I didn't even tell my husband at first that I had sort of uh, come up with this, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, like I said, scheme, plot, whatever, uh, for uh, training Poppy. Um, but the other day he was walking around the apartment. He was like, wow, it's so amazing. We've gotten so rid of so much stuff. Isn't it great? <laughs> I was like, oh, let me tell you what I've been doing. Oh, so, yeah. A uh, big fan now of Buy Nothing for, um, for this reason and, uh, and the same reasons as before. And actually, um, if you're not on Facebook or even if you are on Facebook, um, make sure to join the School for the Dogs community app. You can get there at schoolforthedogs.com slash community or it's in the app store um, because uh, we're starting to do buy nothing there for dog stuff uh, really with anyone um, who is there uh, buy nothing is generally more of a local group but hey if you want uh, something I'm giving away for free and I certainly have lots of dog things to give away for free all the time um, if you're willing to pay for the shipping I will happily ship it to you uh, so make sure to join the app for that fun reason, um, although it might not help you uh, with training your dog to uh, be good with people coming through the door if it's through the mail, but it doesn't stop it from being fun. Last thing I wanted to talk about today in this episode that's kind of jumping around um, but thanks for being here, <laughs> is uh, just a funny thing that happened last night with my daughter, who is two and a half, that involves getting behaviors using negative reinforcement and the problem, or one problem with doing that. Um, so six months ago or so, I uh, was trying to get her to brush her teeth, and I told her, hey, if you don't brush your teeth, your teeth are gonna fall out. And as soon as I said it, I thought, oof, I shouldn't have said that because of course your teeth are gonna fall out eventually. And of course, when you're five or six, it's actually quite rewarding when your teeth fall out. And I don't want her to think when her teeth do fall out that it happened because she didn't brush her teeth enough. So I thought, you know, okay, I'm never gonna tell her that again because it's, it's too complicated <laughs> to explain that actually your teeth are gonna fall out once I've told her that they're gonna fall out if she doesn't brush her teeth. But she hung on to this notion that she has to brush her teeth uh, or else her teeth would fall out, even though I was not really 
re reinforcing uh, this idea anymore. And every now and then she would say, if I don't brush my teeth, are my teeth going to fall out? And I'd say, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking maybe, maybe by the time her teeth actually do fall out, uh, she'll forget about these conversations. But last night she said to me um, that she didn't want to brush her teeth because she wanted her teeth to fall out because she wanted the tooth fairy to come. She watches a lot of Peppa Pig, and there's a Peppa Pig episode where uh, the tooth fairy comes to give Peppa Pig money for her tooth. And it just struck me as such a funny example how, of how with with uh, any kind of training, you know, what was a reward can become an aversive and vice versa. Um, you know, here uh, suddenly her teeth coming out, I was getting her to, you know, brush her teeth by th the threat that if she didn't, something would be taken away from her, literally her teeth, uh, became something that she actually wanted. So the behavior I had been trying to encourage with the threat that otherwise her teeth would be taken away uh, suddenly became discouraged because she actually liked the idea that her teeth may be uh, taken away because it would mean the tooth fairy would come. So um, quick thinking, my husband and I said, you know what, the tooth fairy only likes very clean teeth. So you better brush those teeth so that the tooth fairy comes. And she, she wasn't sure she was buying this idea. So I called Kate, Kate Sinisi, my business partner, last night, uh, like 8 p.m. She picked up and I said, uh, hello, is this the tooth fairy? She was like, Annie? <laughs> and I just turned my back on Magnolia quickly and said, Kate, can you just pretend you're the tooth fairy for a second? And I said, Kate, um, Magnolia here uh, doesn't believe me that um, you only like clean teeth. Can you tell her? And so I put Magnolia on the phone with Kate, uh, who did a very good impromptu impression of the tooth fairy explaining to two-year-old Magnolia why it's so important to brush your teeth. So big thanks to uh, Kate Sinisi for helping me train my daughter to brush her teeth. And uh, I assured Magnolia uh, that the behavior of toothbrushing will be positively reinforced in the future because talking to the tooth fairy is very positively reinforcing and I have her phone number.